Now, what we are going to do is to try and understand more about translational research. How do you pick up different uh, topics or domains for research? So we are essentially going to look at contextualizing research in consonance with the national agenda. Because what is vital for a country that is uh, in a resource limited setting is to look at how we can apply research for public health purposes is something which is uh, important for all of us. All right? So if you look at what, uh, what we had written in terms of the objectives for this particular session, we'll understand issues around evidence-based programming and elements that are associated with successful translation. We'll understand the complexities uh, in undertaking research in basic science, epidemiology, clinical, and effectiveness of program strategies per se, because that helps the programs to run more effectively and to understand the challenges and opportunities in harmonizing national and global research priorities. And to do all this, perhaps we have the most uh, experienced people on the dais who would help me make that understanding a little better uh, than what I would do myself. If you think of research, to me, if you ask me, research is more like a luxury in resource-limited settings. Research is associated with long, enduring, and a patient work. No? You tend to spend large number of years to you know, prove your hypothesis, and that requires huge amount of patience. To me, translational research is a low-hanging fruit, because you tend to get successes as a shortcut, you know, because you choose your topic in such a manner that you can perhaps be far more successful very quickly. It can lead to formulating newer policies, the strategies, or modifying the strategies that are existent and benefit millions of people. It does not mean, to my mind now, some of the thoughts are my own. People may agree, people may not agree with me. But it does not mean that one should not do basic research. One must remember the mRNA vaccines, which we know as one of the most evolved step in vaccination. The mRNA research took place in 1990s, and the scientists found it very difficult to even publish those <laughs> results at that point in time. But after two decades, people realized its importance. And that's something which we have to keep at the back of mind. How does one select a domain for translational research? One which we must remember, you must find disease which has a high disease burden, or perhaps a niche area in one of those diseases where answers uh, for even treatment strategies do not exist as of now. Maturity of national programs, you know, what kind of strategies they are adopting, where are we, and what is most important, is the program flexible enough to actually try and take up any knowledge gap to be covered with newer strategies. We must also reflect within and try and see one's own competence and the ecosystem in which you are placed, because that should be one which should enable you to uh, ensure that your research could be really productive. And interest of funding agents is extremely critical because not every area is considered as a fundable area by uh, agencies per se. It is important to keep your eyes fixed on the long-term goal, but we must break the journey into small steps. <laughs> now I'll try to give examples. As I saw, I have spent about three decades in HIV, and we know we transformed the whole scene um, of HIV in the country, and effectively enough. If you actually look at, you know, what made the huge difference? It was one case series of five patients that were found in Los Angeles who had certain different presentation. And even a small case series can lead to such a good discovery that it shaped the entire approach uh, of understanding AIDS, and then we, what followed was AIDS pandemic that we all know. But should this be considered as an important approach per se?
perhaps not you need to be very lucky to come out with those five cases because you need to be extremely vigilant but even a case series or a case report can make a difference not only here if you recall legionnaire's disease was actually discovered out of a conference just because people were vigilant it is not necessary that you should conduct a very large study to make a difference i recall my early days in 1989 if you look at the setting that we had in india people used to say an elisa test was not even possible in blood bank it was not there in public health setting what did we do one of the things that was done was we tested professional blood donors and the reason was simple it is a transfusion transmitted disease so 70 odd professional donors that time more than 60% of the blood used to come from professional donors and when we tested only 70 people we found 63 of them as infected and the result we followed up with a pil that time i used to be in bombay and the result was even in the blood bank the government was forced to go for hiv testing and that's how elisa testing actually came into vogue it was a difficult time because that time the testing used to be only for malaria syphilis which was not elisa based if you look at the national backdrop of hiv it's a disease that is seen among sinners was a strong notion that was prevalent at that time the challenge was nobody was interested in working over hiv at that time the challenge was to generate evidence and inform that it can pose threat to mainstream population and at that time national aids research institute was established in pune and people used to think at least i used to think when i was shifted from bombay to pune that this is a conservative society you may not see hiv as much as you will see in uh, bombay and the result was when we started working we shackled the myth you know what we found that if you look at female sex workers their prevalence was 56% if you look at male std patients the clients of sex workers you found that the prevalence was almost 20% and you look at the incidence in both the cases you suddenly find that we became number one globally when it came to these abnormal numbers to my mind at that juncture because nobody expected at that point in time what was the use what was it that we used in india this particular evidence you know what we said was our epidemic is sex work driven if it is driven by sex work we need to look at the local evidence and deploy right kind of strategies if you look at hiv control strategies in india we went more towards sex work driven approaches the key sub populations and issues surrounding that whereas for rest of the world it was general population that they used you look at another national backdrop no if you look at std control program national std control program was established in pre independence era because britishers were worried about syphilis that they may acquire but it was a completely different program in our time in 1990s most of the practitioners used to use the etiologic treatment patient resorted to polypharmacy and they would never come back to you on the next day the result was it was very difficult to treat them and for hiv we wanted to ensure that the treatment takes place on the same day so who came out with syndromic management and there was a huge resistance among practitioners to do that kind of an approach in management per se one of the research which we did we tried to use for the first time i heard that time a name called as multiplex pcr we tried to look at these std patients and what did we find we found that 20% of the patients they tend to have two different more than one std at any given point in time and they were shedding almost all of them were shedding hiv uh, dna 
uh, in the secretions that were around there. The result was, this was a finding which was used all over for promoting syndromic management in India, which made a huge difference because today you look for STD patients, you find they are hardly there. One of the studies was we wanted to see that uh, people support us when we look at, uh, when we look at uh, uh, trying to develop the strategies that you require for other patients. No? As I said earlier, people used to say this is a sinner's disease. Now, how do you do that? So we looked at our own data that we had, and we also found that HIV was spreading rapidly among married monogamous women. And when it was spreading in married monogamous women, one of the impact was this particular data was used in Southeast Asia to advocate for women-centric prevention approaches. And what was most important, you know, you suddenly found that the government understood that this can affect the mainstream population. And we can't only think of them as sinners because they have not indulged, these women have not indulged in any risky behavior, but still they have acquired HIV. And that reduced the stigma that was associated and perhaps also uh, ensured that progressive policies could come in. We did a lot of nested case control studies. Now, in nested case cohort studies, one of the study was we, we were the first in the world to show that counseling works. Now, counseling, if you look at the research designs that you need to prove whether counseling is effective, is perhaps one of the most uh, difficult challenge in terms of study designs. What we did was we did a nested case control, uh, nested case cohort study where it became, uh, became one of those uh, best practices in UNAIDS and it used to be talked about more because this was the first study of its own kind. And this was very important because we could employ counselors, the evidence that we provided forced the government to employ counselors in all testing sites and STD control sites. If you look at circumcision, no? We know circumcision used to protect people from acquiring HIV. But we wanted to see whether it is true. So we did another uh, case, uh, case control study. If I no, it was an observational study. No, what we did was we tried to look at our patients that were coming. And we were the first in the world at that time who showed that circumcision protects you against HIV infection, but it does not protect you against STDs, and therefore, perhaps it could be an equalizer. And that led to a huge number of studies and trials across in the world, but we were trying to address an issue which was important from our own perspective in India. Using the learnings from the past, the married monogamous study that made people change the attitude towards HIV-infected women. Interventions among HIV pregnant women for prevention of mother-to-child transmission, starting with zidovudine and nevirapine, became more important. And that was something which I learned when I was at Hopkins. You know, when you approach towards policy, which are the areas you should choose? And that I did it once I came back from Hopkins. The result was PMTCT, Prevention of Mother to Child Transmission Program, actually developed very well. And in 2002, we could actually roll out this particular program. But what is most important, you know, what we were tweaking with, what we were fighting with was a major issue because India never had any program to treat patients for life. You know, in HIV infection, you have to treat everybody until the person dies. And when we, when we looked at PMTCT as one program that was accepted, it became easy to advocate for free antiretroviral therapy program that improves the survival of people. Research that impacts HIV disease management, we also did what is called as HPTN 052 trial. 
this was a collaborative effort across in the world. It was a NIH uh, 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 trial. What we showed that if you put a patient on antiretroviral therapy, you will perhaps reduce the risk of transmission of HIV to an uninfected partner by 93%, and it reduces incidence of opportunistic infection. And that was used for pushing test and treat strategy, which was accepted in 2017 uh, in India, but it was adopted globally far earlier. In another study, we showed that 13.3% individuals fail at the end of first year, and this evidence was used to push for plasma viral load testing, which is very costly in even Indian program. In conclusion, keep a long-term goal, break it in small achievable but critical steps, learn to communicate for effective advocacy using means, all means that you have, stay focused, gather a passionate research team. In today's world, evidence-based policies are becoming more common wherever necessary, look for national or international collaborations. Thank you.